Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a session on thorny problems and open source community management. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone uh, there in uh, uh, your hemisphere uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, good morning uh, for me. I'm in the United States, uh, outside of Chicago. Uh, so today we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about some of the like really difficult and challenging problems that can come up sometimes in a in a community. And I'm going to be talking about them primarily from the perspective of um, dealing with uh, code of conduct enforcement and uh, community conflict resolution. Um, and my perspective, um, having helped out with that uh, for last eight years or so uh, within the Drupal open source community. Um, so I'll start with a, just a brief introduction. Hello, uh, my name is George Demet. I use he, him pronouns. You can follow me on Twitter at gdemet. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of uh, Palantir.net. Uh, we are an open source uh, digital consultancy based outside of Chicago. Uh, the, please do not confuse us with another company with a very similar name. Remember, we're the ones with .NET, and that's important. Uh, so as I mentioned before, um, I uh, was one of the founding members of the uh, Drupal Community Working Group's conflict resolution team. Uh, so we started the group. Uh, we were chartered in 2013. And um, I actually just stepped down uh, last month um, after serving for eight years uh, to make way for fresh talent and leadership on the team. Um, however, I continue to remain involved with the group as part of the uh, community health team, uh, which is a group that we created uh, within the community working group to work on kind of proactive fit measures to help improve community help, uh, health, uh, things that would go beyond uh, just sort of code of conduct enforcement and conflict resolution. Um, so I continue to be remain involved there. I'm also still very much in communication with the other members of the conflict resolution team, helping out on issues where I might have some uh, institutional knowledge or uh, for issues that have been going on for some time. Um, I. Uh, we have a lot of experience in the Drupal community over the last decade or so um, of relevance to this talk is that um, I was also one of the co-authors of uh, the original version of uh, Drupal's code of conduct that's used for events. Uh, it's gone through a few uh, iterations uh, since uh, I think 2012 or so, but um, I, I, I've been involved every step of the way. So. Um, just to provide a little bit of context and background for Drupal, for those who may not be familiar with the project, uh, we are one of the largest uh, independent open source projects in the world. And what I mean by independent open source projects is that uh, Drupal does not uh, have a corporate sponsor. Uh, it's not uh, run by um, you know, a large foundation that makes decisions about uh, code and contribution. We are an independent uh, open source project. We do have a nonprofit that provides a lot of support for the project. Um, but they typically don't get involved in sort of uh, product direction. Um, we have uh, tens of thousands of active contributors, and that can range um, anywhere from folks who are uh, working on issues and contributing code on Drupal.org, which is our uh, main project and community site. Uh, we have a very active community Slack. Uh, we've got, uh, there's different Facebook groups and pages and GitHub and events and just, all sorts of stuff going on with Drupal all over the world. And um, used by millions of sites, um, one of the uh, top um, open source CMSs out there, everything from, uh, I said corporate blogs, I meant personal blogs in the slide, uh, all the way up to large corporate enterprises that you know may be running hundreds of different digital properties on a single platform. So, um, you know, and, and we've been around a long time. Uh, they, uh, the project just celebrated its uh, 20th anniversary last month. Uh, so, um, and we are currently in version nine, a major version nine. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's been a, a project that's had a lot of uh, longevity to it. So the way that we do community management, and again, when I'm talking about community management here, I'm, you know, it's fairly loose, um, you know, but we have um, a community code of conduct 
that is maintained and enforced by a volunteer team. That's the community working group or the CWG. Uh, the oversight for that group is provided by um, members, uh, community elected members of the um, of the board of trustees of the Drupal Association, which is that nonprofit which helps run Drupal.org, which provides a lot of um, assistance and support to the project, runs the uh, annual some uh, uh, semi-annual uh, DrupalCon conferences. And um, also, you know, is really that place um, to make sure things on the project and community are running smoothly. So they have two members on their board of directors that are directly elected by members of the community. So those two members of the board, along with uh, an independent representative uh, from a different open source project who's uh, selected by the board at large, it's that group of three people provide the oversight uh, for the community working groups, um, conflict resolution team, uh, they uh, you know they have to sign off on any new members that are added to the team. Um, if there is an issue that needs to be appealed to a higher body, um, they're the ones who uh, review that. And so, uh, the the independent representative on. Uh, on that group right now is actually John O'Bacon, who's I think a lot of folks probably here probably know who he is. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, um, we don't uh, keep that group too busy or we haven't kept that group too busy. Um, and uh, yeah, but it, that's that sort of level of accountability and support. So um, as I mentioned before, uh, we have our semi-annual conferences, um, one typically in North America, one typically in Europe, and um, they have their own event code of conduct um, that, that goes into kind of more specifics around issues that would be associated with in-person um, or now virtual events. And that is enforced directly by the paid staff of the Drupal Association. Um, and then we also have, uh, you know, a lot of local community organizations all over the world, uh, and they often run their own events, you know, Drupal camps, and those are largely run independently, um, and will have their own uh, code of conduct and their own enforcement mechanisms within within those local communities. One of the things um, that we've done uh, to help provide additional support. Uh, for those um, for those local communities and for those independent events, as we actually um, do code of conduct enforcement uh, training, uh, it's a workshop that's um, provided by Sage Sharp, um, and we strongly encourage anyone who is running a local event to have at least one person on their organizing team who has been through that training by Sage. Um, so that's the kind of little bit of a background, uh, you know, about where I'm coming from the experience and perspective that I'm bringing to um, what we're talking about today. And, you know, what I really wanted to do, you know, in the in the sort of brief time we have together is uh, go through some of sort of the, the most challenging and sort of sticky and complicated issues that we've run up against um, over the uh, last eight years. And I'm going to talk about them sort of as, as an abstract. We've seen kind of uh, clusters of issues around these sort of problem spaces, as I'm going to refer to it. So dive right in. Um, problem number one is um, harassment that occurs outside of community spaces. Uh, so the the situation here, right, is that, um, you know, online harassment, uh, particularly on social media, has become a huge issue, especially in the last few years. Um, and you have folks who feel that no matter what they do or say outside of a project space, it's only their behavior within the project space that should matter. Um, and in fact, you know, the, we, a lot of the very popular open source codes of conduct, um, you know, one of them actually is the contributor covenant. I absolutely love the contributor covenant uh, in almost every respect. But um, one challenge I have is that it does... Um, you know, restrict scope to community spaces or individuals who are officially representing the community in some way. Um, the issue with that is that things like brigading, cyberbullying, um, other forms of harassment, very often against marginalized members of the community, but not exclusively, 
usually occur or originate on social media and other places that are outside of community control, right? And as I look at it, you know, if you are, you know, harassing and attacking someone who is another member of your community on social media, you can't not then turn around and expect them to collaborate with you in a project space and pretend like nothing happened, right? Um, in recent years, we've also seen several cases where, um, you know, uh, we've had folks try to organize anonymous harassment campaigns against members of our community. Um, and those are incredibly difficult to address, um, especially when, you know, there's insufficient evidence to sort of prove who's behind them. You can guess, you have suspicion, you might have, um, you know, some little piece of circumstantial evidence that might point to a person or a group of folks who might be involved. Um, but, um, you know, uh, you don't have, you know, what we, what we would call the smoking gun piece of evidence. And, you know, and of course, the issue we've also seen uh, is that, you know, you can report harassment and abuse um, all you want, but very often, uh, you know, the platforms involved, Twitter, Facebook, what have you, won't take action uh, unless it, it violates their, um, you know, their rules in some very particular way. Um, you know, the other, the other issue is that, you know, uh, public expressions of discriminatory views or hate speech by high profile community members also have a negative impact on the community, even when they occur outside of community spaces, right? So, I mean, if, if somebody who's a high profile member of your community or a leader in your community is on their personal Twitter saying, you know, racist, misogynistic, transphobic, homophobic things, that is going to, you know, have an impact on your community. It's gonna reflect poorly on your community and um, that is something that needs to be addressed in some way, shape, or form. So, um, so this next slide for this particular problem, I talk about some possible solutions. These are some things that we've tried. Um, this is not um, comprehensive, um, nor will the possible solutions I present for any of these problems be comprehensive. They're just some of the things that we've tried um, to address them. They may or may not be helpful for you in your community. Uh, so. First and foremost, in Drupal, we define the scope of our community fairly broadly um, to include interactions between community members regardless of venue, right? And we do have to carve out some exceptions here because um, you could have two people who are members of the same community and who have a dispute um, that is not related to the project. You know, if it's a, a workplace dispute, Obviously, that is not a place where the community can get involved. That is, that is handled elsewhere. Um, and uh, you know, but beyond that, you know, we really are, you know, and we had an issue uh, that we came up with last year, where that we had last year, where there was somebody who um, was who was engaging in some uh, some harassment within a community space, and then also. Um, following up with more a more intense level of harassment uh, via social media. Um, you know, so you know, so in that case, like we had to con we did consider the entirety of that person's um, interactions when deciding what next what next steps to take. Um, so this really goes to the next point, which is focusing on the impact um, of an individual's words or actions rather than when or where they occurred or what their intent were. You get a lot of folks who are like, oh, I didn't mean that. I was just joking, et cetera. The bottom line is that you have to focus on the impact and that and that you need to make it really clear in your in your community that folks do need to hold themselves responsible for their words and actions and the impact they have on others. Um, so to the third point here, right, you know, I want to be really clear. People can have whatever political views they want. We do not want to be in a position, we will not be in a position where we're doing any kind of policing of political speech of individuals in our community. But again, you know, if somebody is saying something, publicly expressing a view, right? And publicly expressing a view is not just holding that view, that's taking an action. Um, and, and when you go to that step, 
you know, where you're taking an action, you are responsible and accountable for it. And, um, you know, and if you are saying something that is going to fundamentally undermine your ability to collaborate with other people in your community, that is something that you need to be, um, you know, uh, to take responsibility for, right? And if you're not willing to take responsibility for the things you say and do, then you need to understand that there may be additional consequences as a result. All right, problem number two, um, handling unreported incidents. Um, so what this is really talking about here um, are situations where uh, you know there is something um, bad that has happened, uh, you know, maybe a, a, an, an incident of harassment or abuse, um, but no one is really willing or comfortable to report it. Uh, so, you know, what we see is that, uh, you know, there may be rumors about an incident or an alleged harasser that's circulating uh, in informal back channels and uh, whisper networks, right? Um, but that the folks who are responsible, whether it's the code of conduct authorities or whoever within the community, may not have been provided with enough information or may not have enough information from those networks in order to be able to take action right? We also see that people uh, may be reluctant to file reports of uh, harassment or abuse that they have either seen or experienced because they're afraid that they might get blamed for actions, any actions taken against the harasser, no matter what steps are taken to uh, protect their identity. Um, or they may see, they may be concerned that they might get someone else in trouble um, as a result of filing a report. So the consequence of this is actually really, really bad. Um, uh, you know, it, it, if, if there are other community members out there who are aware uh, that an incident of harassment or abuse has occurred and knows that people are talking about it, um, but does not see any action being taken by, you know, the code of conduct uh, enforcement folks or other uh, responsible folks in the community, they may lose faith uh, in the community's willingness or ability to, to address these kinds of issues, right? And um, so that is, is something, again, that can really kind of fundamentally undermine sort of the level of trust and psychological safety you have in your community. So um, possible solutions. We allow folks to file anonymous informal reports. Um, we are very open with, about uh, how reports are handled, what information will and will not be shared publicly. Uh, we are very clear that information circulated on whisper networks is not in on of its own actionable, may need to be corroborated. Um, and then to try and gain that additional information, um, we communicate directly, privately, and discreetly with those who might have secondhand knowledge of an incident, i.e. that somebody who may not have been involved, directly involved in the incident, but who may have observed it or heard about it from someone who is involved to try and gain additional information and also as a way of helping those who have been involved understand what is being done to address the, uh, you know, what they've experienced. All right, so I am moving very quickly now for the next three problems, enforcing event bans. Um, you know, a lot of open source communities are very decentralized. Uh, event organizers don't talk to each other. So that means that events may not always be and local communities may not always be aware that a person has been banned from attending or speaking at other community events. You also have events that might be aware, but choose to invite a banned person to speak or attend because they don't agree with the reasons that they were banned. I was speaking with someone from another open source community earlier this week where they had the same thing happen. Someone who was very outspoken and was saying a lot of very destructive things within the community had been banned from speaking at official events, so they just went and started speaking at a bunch of unofficial events. Um, one of the uh, things that we're seeing right now with virtual events is it's a lot easier for people to evade bans. They register under a false name and email, they turn off their camera, and they surreptitiously show up and sometimes, um, you know, cause trouble. Um, 
We also have debated a long time back and forth whether it's possible to publish or share a list of individuals who have been banned. Uh, where we are currently coming down in the Drupal community is that we're not able to do that for a variety of reasons, but it's an ongoing conversation. So possible solutions, making it really clear uh, to folks who have been banned from physical events that the ban also extends to virtual ones, making it really clear what the consequences are for evading a ban, um, and um, we also allow event organizers who have concerns that they might inadvertently invite a banned person to submit to share the list of attendees with us. We can review that. If we see someone on the list who shouldn't be there, we will reach out directly to that person. We will not involve the event organizer. We'll reach out directly to the person and say, hey, you were banned. You need to withdraw right away. And they will do that. Um, and um, some communities may be able to take action against events that deliberately invite banned speakers, right? Uh, removal of the project name or other uh, kinds of support. So I wanna get to this last uh, point right here because this is a really important one, accountability, redemption, and reconciliation. So this is the question of folks who have been banned is there a way back, a path back to re-engagement with the community, right? And this is such a difficult issue because very often damage that's caused by an individual's bad behavior has an impact on the entire community, not just those who are directly involved. And that means that in order to repair that damage, an individual needs to not only undergo a personal transformation, and they need to not just be sorry for what they've done, but they need to be willing and able to rebuild trust and hold themselves accountable for their past behavior. And even if all of that occurs, you will very likely have some community members who will object to any previously banned individual being allowed to return under any circumstances. Um, so when this comes up, um, we are very upfront with banned individuals that the path back is not an easy one. There will be setbacks. Uh, but we talk with people who know the banned individual to assess the level and sincerity of their personal transformation. Before we take any action, we talk with those who are most directly impacted by the individual's past behavior. If all of those passes the sniff test, if everyone is okay with it, we start small. We let the individual re-engage with the community in a very limited way doesn't work out, you can always pull the plug. And we just are prepared for the individual to walk away from the process if they encounter resistance. It's very disappointing because there's a lot that folks can invest and they're like, you know what, this is too much. Turns out I can't handle it. I need to just walk away. Okay, we'll be here when you're ready. I wanna close with this quote uh, from Bell Hooks, which summarizes kind of a lot of what I was just talking about in that last slide. Um, and informed a lot of what we did during my tenure on the Drupal Community Working Group, which is, uh, for me, forgiveness and compassion are always linked, right? How do we hold people accountable for wrongdoing and yet at the same time remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed? So with that, thank you. Um, I don't know if we have any time for any questions, but if we do, I am here and, uh, willing to answer them yes thanks george um we actually still have a lot of time but not so many questions oh, um, okay but um yeah then i can uh, at least make a, a, a comment um sure i really liked uh, your your point about um what happens after the ban like how can someone maybe get back into the community or not um, under which circumstances it's something that's often overlooked often ends with how to enforce the the guidelines that's it yeah it, it is it is really hard um we've had um you know we've had a couple people try it um and you know in and i would say we're probably batting uh maybe you know 50 50 right now in terms of of success um you know and and i think a lot of it has to do with the scope of the and severity of the incident that got you banned in the first place. Um, you know, so if you're somebody who has an established history of, you know, just being a difficult person for many years and causing a lot of people a lot of grief, um, I think that is going to be a much 
um, harder road to climb because you're going to have to rebuild trust and connections with so many people, uh, including a bunch of people who you never even knew you were hurting in the first place. Um, so that's really, really hard. Um, I think if you're somebody who, um, you know, who, who made a few mistakes, um, then, um, you know, and, and those mistakes were, were, were fairly limited and, you know, and you really are able to demonstrate like, look, that was the person I was then. This is the person I am now. Here are the ways in which I've grown and transformed and changed this person and how I want to repair that damage. Um, there's a little more hope there. Yes. Okay. Um, I think there are no more questions in the uh, chat or questions tool, um, but maybe someone um, has a more uh, in-depth or private question they want to discuss in the breakout room. So. Yeah. Um, and I just want to I just want to give a call out. Um, you know, if there is anyone out there from another community, um, we just had a call earlier this week. So the the Drupal Community Health Team is um, actively seeking out uh, folks uh, who are involved with code of conduct enforcement um, from other projects. Uh, we're kind of putting together a little group to kind of talk about some of the common issues that we see, um, develop some frameworks for, uh, you know, shared frameworks for ways that we can address them, as well as address, you know, an issue that we've also seen, which is, you know, where people may jump from project to project um, to try to, you know, uh, evade consequences mm. um and um so so please reach out to me um you see my twitter up there um you know and um i'm always happy to chat 